welcome to Think Tech Hawaii in our special series on community matters, with a focus obviously on the upcoming election in November 2024. And to this uh, episode's focus is on the various cultural constituencies in Hawaii. Now, what do we mean by that? You can't be in politics without knowing that they are people with their own particular culture differences and contributions to the state of Hawaii. And so it uh, becomes important to explore what these groups have going for the election. So as usual, uh, we have a couple of guests with us this afternoon. We have, first of all, Sergio Akubila from the Workers Center, which it that's a story in itself, Sergio. So you got to bring us up to date on what a worker center does. And and also we have Shanti Astor, who, in addition to being, you know, a, a, a dedicated public service, actually is a more of a community advocate than uh, than most people may know. I mean, having served on, for example, the Board of Education, and as well as her work helping people who are being helped by the Worker Center. And, and so there's this uh, kind of relationship. Now, why are these people invited? Because, first of all, the largest constituency in Hawaii now, the largest population group, are people of Filipino ancestry. And I don't know if people, we know that. Now, it's true that the number of uh, people of uh, Filipino ancestry have gotten elected to various levels uh, in politics. Uh, but, you know, it's an evolving um, population. And in addition, I think, anyway, and in addition with Shanti, Shanti represents the group that probably most people know the least about. And those are our Pacific Islanders. And how are they, they faring in this upcoming election ought to be of interest to all of us. So first of all, welcome, Sergio. Welcome, Shanti. And as usual, we have our group of pundits uh, way off in Georgia, sitting in Georgia, <laughs> trying to protect somebody's election. We have... <laughs> Chad, uh, Chad, how long have you been in uh, out there in in, um, in Georgia? I'm Chad, in, thank you, oh, I was going to say Chad Civil Beat, but it's actually <laughs> Chad Blair. You know, I knew there was a B in uh, there. Chad, uh, Chad uh, and uh, Colin uh, Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii, uh, and of course uh, Jay Fidel, who actually is our tech guy. But um, he likes to get involved with, uh, this, with the discussion, so we're gonna we're gonna encourage him to. Anyway, Sergio, what's the Worker Center, and who are you organizing, and how is that related to what Shanti does? So we can so get worker. some context to this conversation. Definitely, Governor. So the Worker Center, we're a nonprofit organization. So again, I'm uh, here in kind of an individual capacity, but I could share a little bit more about the Worker Center. So we organize the low-wage non-union workers to basically organize for their own uh, political, economic, and social well-being. Uh, so if we think about the minimum wage folks that are working in the gas stations, that are working, you know, in um, Safeway, work, working in these, you know, the majority of the population, the majority of the community, we're not all in unions, as many people may think, because, you know, Hawaii is a, such a strong uh, blue state. But, you know, th those are the folks that we're organizing. Uh, those are the ones that we're finding to be the most exploited are our minimum wage workers. And we uh, even that group, we've even narrowed it down further. Um, you know, when we first started the Worker Center, when we spoke with, with people, there were two groups that we identified, uh, Filipino immigrants recently that came uh, to Hawaii and uh, those that are uh, part of the COFA uh, community, the Compact of Free Associations. Um, that one, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll let Chanti talk a little bit about more, but um, on our end, those were the two kind of working class communities 
that we found to be the most exploited. Our office is here at the Towers of Cahill Park in the heart of Kalihi, uh, and this is a working class neighborhood. So th these are the folks that come into us. You know, they can't find an attorney. You know, they may have a legal issue at work, but you know, no attorney is gonna, gonna take their case if they're making minimum wage, unless it's it's a really big, some sort of class action. So sometimes they have questions about work related issues. And then we'll ask them, is that, you know, is the same issue happening to other workers as well? And then when we find out that it's kind of systemic, you know, that's when we start organizing. And so that uh, takes you over to Shanti. So Shanti, how does your, what do you do fit into what, uh, uh, Sergio just described. Yeah, thank you so much. Aloha, everyone, and thank you for having Aloha. me in this space. I want to um, just thank Sergio because most of the work they do is a continuation of our advocacy work. There are definitely areas where most of our community advocates can't do as far as in the fighting the legal battles. And so many of the constituents and clients that uh, uh, white workers do are people that are cha being channeled from the work we're doing and uh, transitioning over to theirs because we have limited uh, capacity and um, and professional um, pool to support them. Uh, I think uh, their most recent client that they've really helped is was going through housing uh, discrimination and challenges. Uh, with all the repairs that are needed to just having a live livable uh, uh, apartment. So many of his clients are COFA or Compact of Free Association uh, citizens or as- um, What is their status in, in Hawaii? What is the COFA status? What is the, what, first of all, what makes them different from a normal immigrant, let's say? Thank and, you. And then what makes them different from an from somebody that can uh, influence, can, can vote in Hawaii? Thank you for that question. So our immigration status is a very unique one. We are being tagged as migrants. So we carry a I-94, not a visa. And where that is very complicated is that I-94 holders are traditionally people that are visiting with a definite expiration date. When we come to the U.S., we hold the I-94 and we can live, work, and stay here indefinitely, which contradicts and undermines the definition of I-94s. And that's one very challenging uh, experience with our community. We do not have visas. We're not required to get visas. Um, there are a lot of FAS are COFA citizens that are now U.S. citizens. We do not have a pathway to becoming citizens. And so there is just a lot of complexity in the status that we have been given to reside and live in the United States. And one last thing, we are not permanent residents. So we will always be remained and uh, identified as uh, alien. I, I think it's a, a we have a alienable uh, status that is not similar to what's being given to immigrants. But oh, we serve in the U.S. military. We pay the same taxes as everybody. It's just the services that we can get. And so I want to, you know, do a big shout out to Senator Irono and all the advocates who have fought so hard and long for us to now regain our eligibility to federal programs. So you do, your voice is being heard by the political system? I mean, is this? We, it, it you used to be not very strong because we don't vote, but there has been a difference now because we're, we're really getting out to our the kids that are born and raised here. There is probably two or three generations that are now eligible to vote because they are U.S. citizens. So that trajectory is looking pretty well than before because most of us have migrated and lived here as COFA citizens with no right to vote. But now it's changing. That course is changing. 
And it's really embedding that strength in the voices of our youths. I'm probably taking more time than I normally do to ask preliminary questions, but I do, switching back to Sergio, want to ask you that traditionally, for, in, in, from a political sense, uh, there's, there is sort of a, 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 at least one major divide in the uh, Filipino community, uh, consisting of those who came during the plantation era and actually integrated in, into, the, into the society. I mean, I become local for all practical purposes and, 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 and have achieved somewhat of success. And those that are newly coming to Hawaii, and sometimes the people coming in the new groups are even better educated than the first wave. But nevertheless, uh, what you're organizing, and when you talk about your population, is there a difference uh, within the population? There definitely is a, a difference, uh, Governor. So if you've attended some Filipino events, you know, where they have- I was gonna wear my barong, but I thought that might be that's right. <laughs> too much. <laughs> Yeah. So those are kind of, we want to say, the more elite class of the community, right? There is an event almost every month. There's some sort of Chernobyl ball, you know, at the fancy hotels. And you know, that's well, that's one group of the community. The other group of the community are those that are, can attend these things. They're working two or three jobs. A lot of them are the more recent immigrants. Um, you know, they're just, yeah, they don't have time to be working or to be attending uh, a lot of these functions. Those are the ones that we normally don't see, but those are the ones that we'll see when we go shopping or when we're out in the community. Um, and there's that there is a disconnect um, between kind of our our community. Um, I, I just don't want to provide a general generality, but there are differences between your group, are. though. You, uh, and I should ask uh, Chad if he has one question. But I do have one major question. Your group of the low wage or lower wage workers. Uh, probably were most affected by the Maui fire. And that's what I hear. That they, that, and, I, and I know you're involved with that. So where do yeah, they uh, stand? Yeah, actually, um, you know, tomorrow we have a big uh, community outreach there uh, in Maui to report back to the community what the findings were from their original um, first few weeks. You know, you know, the statistics say 40% of Lahaina is mostly Filipino or have connections to the Philippines. But the ones that are also being lost are the ones that, you know, English is not their first language. There's language access issues. So tomorrow we're going to see where they are one year later in terms of did they get those resources? Uh, were they able to get the help that they need? One of the things that we're hearing is, uh, especially with the large Maui fire settlement of a billion, of what, $4 billion dollars, you know, the large Filipino community there is, you know, they're asking it, how come, you know, are, are part of that? Those are some of the legal questions that they have. And if English is not your first language, a lot of times you're going to get left out. I'm going to pass this off to my colleagues who I know are chomping at the bit. And so we'll go to Georgia first, you know. Chad? Thank you, Governor. Well, I think, uh, and I know Sergio and um, you know, we've known... Uh, you're from Kosrai, aren't you, Shanti? Is that right? Yes, that's nice. Um, I think the thing I'm most intrigued about is, although the Filipino population is approaching a sizable amount, as we talked about on a recent program, and I think Colin agreed, they haven't yet achieved uh, a, a significant impact on electing people. Yes, we've had a Filipino-American governor, I believe the only one in the country, on Ben Cayetano, and members of the Supreme Court here and some other positions, but have not yet, and Sergio, if you want to correct me otherwise, actually the first time I met Sergio, as I asked him how to pronounce his name, I remember to this day, Alcubilia, right? Alcubilia. <laughs> um, but it still hasn't yet, and, and you alluded to it, they're too busy working, they've got too many other things to do. And with the Micronesian population, I think what is so intriguing, as Shanti said, the, the younger generation, second and third generation, are already, I mean, they are going to reach critical mass if they aren't already there. And I think it's only a matter of time where you are going to see uh, someone running for office and, and hopefully uh, proud and reflecting their Micronesian heritage 
with the caveat that there are multiple Micronesian heritages and we don't want to just group everybody together, which is another problem. Same with Filipinos, right? I mean, they're a very distinct region. So I'm intrigued by it, but I wonder how long it's going to take because unlike the Japanese American population or the Haole population, even the native Hawaiian population to an extent, uh, even the Chinese population, so small, has been able to have a major impact at the political, socioeconomic level. I do wonder how long it will take to reach that critical mask among these two groups. You got any idea? <laughs> you know one of you? I think someone like Sergio, when you ran against Ed Case, pretty, pretty remarkable thing to do to take on a longtime incumbent. And you did pretty well. And you were also very graceful in defeat. And that was, I think, remarkable. And instead of turning around and running again, you've, you've stayed with community activism. And I think, I mean, that's how Barack Obama did it. Uh, and um, I think that's a very good, good pathway. And, and Shanti, I can't speak to your own, own interesting, uh, your developments. I mean, you're an educator is my understanding and, and you're an advocate for the community. But I do think it does, uh, it, it, you need a, a Jack Burns, you need a John Wahee, you know, you need a Ben Cayetano, a leader who then will get others to follow along. I mean, Colin can talk to this, but still so many of us tend to choose the same ethnicity. Lacking any other information, we'll look out of a ballot and say, oh, I'll go for the Japanese name or I'll go for the Filipino name and, and so forth. Uh, and I wonder how much that still holds true today. I think there is still something there. The name recognition. So, Sergio, do you want to go first or I can um, maybe... Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Fine. Okay. So, thank you for that question. And um, one thing, uh, as when I serve on the Board of Education, I am not an educator um, by trade. But when I served on the Board of Education, the biggest struggle and challenge I saw was it's been over two decades now that our kids were that were born and raised here were in a system that unfortunately um, tolerate racism. So we have a lot of students that graduated but did not go into to the traditional college pathway to really elevate their education to a point where today some of them are 30 in their late 30s, but they are not ready to take on leadership position because they were never prepared for it while in school. If you look around, most of the COFA advocates today are not raised here. We were mostly born and raised in the islands, came to school in Hawaii or anywhere in the U.S. continent to be where we're at today. So as far as that timeline, I am really hoping that in the next five to 10 years, someone who is currently pursuing their uh, their bachelor's or master's degree and is a U.S. citizen and can run for office will take that chance. Many of them are intimidated to take on leadership role because they did not go to college. And many of them did not really, uh, some advocates are not running because they are not eligible to run. The ones that may be ready for leadership positions. So it may be a five to 10 year waiting period. And that's why a lot of the work that we do now are really focused in empowering our students from high school to college and college afterwards. So they can start that experience and leading to give them the confidence that they are ready and they do belong in there and they can do it. I think that's really the challenge I, but this is my personal observation being on the board. I hope that provides somewhat an answer to your question. Colin, looks like you want to jump into this conversation. So, yeah, sure. I mean, well, thanks for these thoughtful answers. Uh, one question I had is what what are the questions you get from members of the community about U.S. politics or about state politics? Um, I, you know, I think sometimes people who are so involved in this forget that this is incredibly complicated, often very, very confusing. And are there are there ways that um, you know there could be better opportunities for civic education or or what are the kind of questions you get what is it that people find especially you know folks who are u.s citizens find intimidating or um, make them less likely to want to participate and, and what are some ways we could perhaps help break down some of those barriers 
Uh, Sergio, you got to say something too. You know, I mean, you're okay. a politician. No, no, no. Oh, yeah. I just, I'll, I'll give Shanti some time to think. But, um, yeah, on, on my end, Colin, I mean, I want our Filipino community to think why do we not belong in these spaces? Why can we not be in these spaces? And this is what I had mentioned to Chad when I first, when I ran um, two years ago. But if we're 25% of the community and there's four in our congressional delegation, how come we have not yet had uh, a person of Filipino descent to represent us at the federal level? You know, I'm seeing kind of the inroads that the Indian American community is making nationally. If you think about it, I mean, I'm impressed. Um, I'm a little bit jealous. So where they see people on the national stage that look like them gives them a sense that, hey, I can go for those type of positions. You know, our, our community, our young people, they don't see, they're starting to see now at our, and of course, Hawaii is a special place, but they don't see, you know, if they turn on the DNC or the RNC, they're not going to see their faces that look like them in those type of spaces. So my hope for the Filipino community is that we can get that type of, of sense that, hey, we to be part of the American fabric, we need to be engaged in local and local and national politics. And, you know, I do have to commend the Indian American community for being out there, uh, left or right, wherever they are, but they're out there and they're getting it done. And that's my whole part. For me, I think of three things. One is mentorship. There is not a lot of mentors that look like this kids. Uh, two is exposure, very similar to what Sergio said. Uh, these kids will always be intimidated until they get into those fields or be given interns opportunities to see that with their culture language, they are competent and ready to really take that next step. And the last one is a support system, not just a support system, but one that is systematic and easily accessible. I think those are the three that will really empower and make a difference in the current barriers and challenges that our kids have or our younger um, youth have. Well, Jay, just for your chance, you know, if you got a question. So, you know, Chad is describing, you know, the, the emergence of these two communities, which are related in their own way, you know, through Sergio's organization and the like. Um, and it sounds like what we really want to do is we want to have the government um, be as diverse as the population. If we see, you know, too few Filipinos or Pacific Islanders in the legislature, we want more. I mean, I, I do, and I think most people do in an ideal sense. It should be a reflection of who's out there, who is in our community. But that's, you know, that's not happening, um, and we need to make it happen. So the, the problem I see, and I would be interested in your thoughts about this, is on the one hand, you do have communities. You have the Filipino community and you have the Pacific Island community, and they, they are defined. I know there's a lot of islands and there's a lot of places in the Philippines, but, you know, they are defined. And you guys are working to further define them and create community, confirm community, so that ultimately these communities have some political influence. Um, but at the same time, you know, the path of an immigrant or a migrant, if you want to use that term. I don't, the, the, the word migrant doesn't sound great these days, you know, sorry. Um, <clears throat> the path of an immigrant is, is, is facing all these assimilation questions. Um, they want to go to law school like both of you have, but you're the minority of the minority going to law school because, you know, education in your respective communities is not all that high a priority or success. <clears throat> and they want to they want to marry often. They want to intermarry. And that's good. We want that. We want Hawaii to be hapa, hapa, hapa. That's what we want. Um, so you have two lines crossing on this chart. One is your efforts to confirm community in your respective communities. And the other is the experience of the immigrant to assimilate, to grab hold of the society in general. And sometimes that does not mean sticking with the community. So you're working, you're working with two lines that may not be going the same direction. I would like your thoughts about that. If I'm wrong, tell me. Wow. Okay, who wants to go first, you know? Sergio, you got the more complicated community yeah. in one respect, so 
you try and uh, take that one off. Jay, when you were speaking, I think one of the first images that came to mind was Kamala Harris, right? I mean, she, <laughs> right? She, she is coming from a background of two immigrant parents. Of course, very different because they're educated. Um, and I think of the other uh, kind of the folks that I I, I meet here in Kalihi in the neighborhood. You know, they also have two immigrant parents, but most of them um, are working class. You know, they're just may may maybe working. Uh, minimum wage jobs. But, you know, whatever you think assimilation may look like in this country, I mean, for me, assimilation, when I came to this country, I yeah, I just wanted to fit in as much as possible and learn English and be able to understand people. But I, I think that's part of the American experience is assimilating um, you know, as an immigrant. And maybe one generation, two generations later that maybe your family becomes fully assimilated. But what I love for our community is not to get lost in the assimilation, um, you know, to, to keep that flavor, <laughs> to keep that flavor of where they're from or where their culture or their roots are from. Um, yeah, be part of the community. But, you know, I, and this is, you know, as what Shanti was saying, is that we need our young people to start thinking that they can be in these spaces. You know, when you walk into a boardroom and you don't see anyone else that looks like you, you've got to start thinking, you know, why can't I be in these spaces as similar as similar? You know, like these people, whatever those paths that people may take, you know, if you decide to to go to law school, you decide to go to medical school or whatever, or, you know, you decide to just inter, you know, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But my point is just as long as people can start thinking kind of outside of their current environment, that, that there is more to them than maybe just working, uh, you know, two or three jobs in order to survive and just kind of just thinking what else can we do? I guess to to give back and serve the community and just be an active part in, in civic engagement here in Hawaii and across the country. Integration. I I, I want to use that word um, more uh, because the challenge that I'm facing when I work with the city and county, one of the biggest thing I want to do is educate, educate, educate. Not just my community, but also the people in the government and our community in general. Because one thing that makes it very difficult is discrimination is real and it is coming hot every single day. So when you will walk up to a Kofa citizen who's using the park, many times people speak down on them or act like we are all violent people. And when we do not humanize the situation, it does not help our community to assimilate because, yes, we do have culture. We're coming from a population where there's probably 10,000. I came from a 10,000 or less community. So we all know each other. And so because of the way people treat us, many of them decide to just put up this wall so that they don't feel less when they work with other people, but that's not always the case. But because of that fear, a lot of them do not try to, you know, um, build relationship outside of that community. And by that, they, they learn slower and they think differently that everyone hates us. That's one. The other one is really, I, I think that because we come from a culture that uses a lot of freedom and we know everybody, you know, the more the merrier kind of thing. When when we lose someone, we come together in hundreds to support each other during that process. But that is now something that people are like, do they have permits? Why are they always gathering in high numbers? They don't really want to know the why. If we had a house and we many of us have mortgages, we would rather be in that, but we don't have that option. And the public parks are the first place we can go to. So I think that if people start thinking that we are part of this community and we are civilized people, that it's okay to approach them and be part of the work I do, which is raise awareness. Tell them, you know, uh, you need a permit. If there's more than 50 of you or you put up tents and stuff, you will need a permit. And this is how you go, go about doing it. There's only a few of us that know the ordinances, the rules, and we are doing our best. But it's like we're fighting this uphill battle because 
some people are retaliating and reacting differently because they are being treated with a lot of disrespect. And so if we just knock down that barrier, I think things will be a lot better with us assimilating or integrating into this community. It's not that we don't want to. We need more people to help us to know. I mean, you know, when I was running for office and on the mantra, the mantra for the Democratic Party from the 50s and the 60s, and, 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 and we still have who is that, this idea that Hawaii uh, is, a, is a kind of special place, that our differences actually unite us so that we're supposed to uh, actually appreciate people being different and, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and the like. So what, what, what you're saying, uh, Shanti, and... Uh, and uh, Sergio indirectly in, in is that may not be true. The political system may not be uh, this vision of uh, of us uh, of creating communities that 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 maintain their own identity and yet somewhat fold together because it's not folding together for some people. Am I correct? I wish everyone know that diversity is a blessing and a, a beautiful thing, uh, but it's not the case. Um, you know, it, it kind of goes back to why are, are people not in leadership position? Because I do my best to get them in while I was on the board, really creating this pathway for more of the people that work for the schools to look like the kids they serve. And many of them got in, but they walked away because of how they're being talked to and treated. Like, you know, if you don't have a degree, you might as well not say what you feel or ask or talk more. And it's not that they're there because of a degree. They're there because of the connection, the language and the respect they bring from that community that the school aspire to serve. And so I'm always getting emotional when I talk about it because we are doing our best, but when they get into places, they still go through that institutional and that stigma. And some of them are not ready to be in that space. So they just walk away and go back work at McDonald's. I want to ask uh, Sergio, you know, a really kind of pointed question. 40% of Lahaina, people affected in Lahaina, were Filipino. Most of and, and I and I'm guilty of this myself. But most of the, the the visions for the future that have evolved out of that tragedy uh, uh, are dominated and uh, for various reasons, historical and otherwise, but nevertheless dominated by a kind of a native hawaiian slash local dream for for the high and i noticed that you're doing all these things with various workers in lahaina and I, and i had the same conversation with the ilwu for example what where 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 does the community you represent fit in that picture uh, from a, because I'm looking at this from a political perspective. I mean, from a political perspective, are you being, do you feel like um, you're going to vote for the people that are in charge? I mean, I know people on the West Coast, on the on, on West part of Oahu, who are, you know, walking around talking about Donald Trump, who I think is is a crazy person, but they're doing that because they don't feel like they're part of the community that they are really part of. And and so you're you know, you got forty percent of the people in Lahaina. Where are they in that's in all of the uh, mix? Yeah, Governor, to also to connect it to what uh, Shanti was saying. Uh, you know, we tout Hawaii as being not a racist place, right? But we do have our implicit biases. And I think that's where our biases are kicking in. When we look at someone that's Filipino, maybe has has a bad accent or you know, someone that's coming from the Pacific you know, Islander community, 
and we make these judgments about them. And I think that's also what's happening in Lahaina because a lot of the folks, the working class folks, um, you know, they were working in the hotels, they were working in, um, you know, kind of the tourism retail industry uh, jobs there in Lahaina. And no one is really asking them. A lot of them are moving out. They're moving to other places. They're just trying to find ways to survive and to keep their family going. The hope is that many of them will stay. It's the, their next generation, the children that are that are born and raised there. And they call Lahaina home and they have that special connection uh, to the community. They want to stay there and make it work. Those are the ones that we are working with to try to organize their parents and you know their aunties and uncles to uh, to come collectively and have a voice because that is the concern is that if they're not organized and they're not working collectively, even though they may have the numbers, their voice is going to get drowned out because of some of these implicit biases that the powers that be or the leaders that make the decisions, you know, they're not going to ask auntie or uncle, you know, what do you think about this or that? Um, you know, they just think, hey, you're working class, you're this and that. And, and they're, even though, um, you know, a lot of that were impacted were um, the, of, Filipino uh, ancestry. There were also many from Kofa. There were also many from the Hispanic community. Um, and it's, we're all kind of in the same boat, is that if we're not working collectively, we're going to get drowned out by the by stronger voices. I'm going to give everybody a chance to ask more questions and not nominate the show, because uh, but we're going to let our guests go pretty soon. So, uh, you know, Chad, uh, yeah. Colin, anybody go what ahead. Ashante, what Ashante said just breaks my heart, because it's true about not welcoming people, about wanting them to go back. I mean, to quote a famous Marshallese poet, no aloha for Hawaiians, and, and it's true. And, and though there is a, a good story about the Japanese Americans and Filipino Americans and some whites in the labor movement coming together in the 54 revolution and we're special, we got some serious problems here and there is serious racism here and it's structural, it's institutional. And I, I'm speaking as a white man who has benefited from that, that structure. And it's, it's terrible. We're more people in our educational system to understand what the Filipinos have gone through historically, the relationships to the United States. Same with the Micronesians from World War II and before and after. Maybe there would be more understanding. But to go up to somebody in a park and tell them they're not welcome here and to challenge them, and that just makes me ill and just put to a lie this whole idea about an aloha spirit. I, Sorry, but Ashanti just kind of got right to the nub of it. Great. Colin, anything to add? I agree with what Chad said. Um, I guess what, let me just ask Sergio and, and Shanti, what, if there were two policy solutions we could start working on, what, what do you think those would be? I mean, if you had a couple of recommendations, um, if you had a magic wand, well, not a magic wand, but um, some kind of uh, policy change, what, what would you recommend? You know, for me, language access, mm -hmm. I think it's important. If we're serious about welcoming people, then let's be serious about making sure that we provide language access for folks. I think that's a way to help people feel welcomed. It's a, it's a good way for people to feel like they're part of their community. Um, you know, and just the way we interact with people. And just second, you know, I, I wish there was something that we could do about hate crimes. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so many times we'll hear uh, a joke, a racial slur, and we'll say, oh, it's okay because it's Hawaii. We make those jokes all the time and we do it equally. But some of those jokes hurt. Uh, you know, some of the some of the groups that get targeted, it is, I would say it is, I, I hate crime almost. Um, so I wish we had strength, stronger laws around that if we're really serious about extending aloha uh, to new groups. Uh, those are the two things that come top to mind. Representation in the workforce. Um, when you create job vacancies, make sure the minimum qualifications celebrate and embrace diversity. That it's not just because of a degree, but because of the culture, the language, and the communities you represent. Because until we change that, we will still walk into DMV and not get the person that we wish for to support us. And so that's been the one thing we keep, the DOE, they created all these positions, but then there's always that one thing that's going to disqualify diversity within the school system. And so I think whatever law it is, uh, I know that 
you know, creating a percent of, uh, of certain minority groups to be in offices or in different places may challenge, be challenging when we address the law, but maybe just creating minimum qualification. And I'm starting there. I'm actually starting a team within the city and county of Honolulu in my office. And one of the minimum qualification is that you speak a second language, you work in the community, and you have experiences serving people in underserved communities. Until we do that, things will never change. Jay? Yeah, look at the two of you. You're you're so strong, articulate, you understand, you have a, a world view, you have a, a view of the future. You are going, both of you are going to make a difference, I'm telling you now. <clears throat> so be patient, Chanty. You, you know, the, the problem with the Pacific Islanders is they're not citizens. And uh, you have to work with Maisie or another champion in the delegation and get to be citizens. That's one thing. The other thing, and I'm focusing on what you're focusing on, education. And, and I think there ought to be special programs to give special benefits and incentives for certain groups, including yours, um, to go to UH um, and to take advanced degrees and um, have a better time of it. You know, the, the percentage of Pacific Islanders at UH is really small. And the same thing, Sergio, with the percentage of Filipinos at UH. It's really small. And the number of Filipino faculty is really small. And yeah, the number Congressman. of Filipino. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I, you know, and I think this, and I agree with Chad, there is an, under, an undercurrent of bias prejudice in Hawaii that we don't it's talk racism. about much. I'm just going to say you know, it's racism. <laughs> one of the most interesting phenomena that I have learned about in the past year is what happened on the plantations. Okay, um, the, the Japanese were doing really well on the plantations um, and they were asking for more money. And the Sugar Planters Association said, we're not going to give you more money. We are going to import a competing group. We are going to import Filipinos, and they are not going to ask for more money. So the Japanese stay the same. The Filipinos are hired cheap. In 1938, the average annual income of a plantation worker in Hawaii who was Japanese was something in the order of, I don't know, six, seven hundred dollars. The average compensation, annual compensation for a Filipino worker was like $400. How do you explain that? Well, it's because the sugar planters, you know, were, were prejudiced. They were biased. And they were trying to hold the Filipinos down. And that hasn't completely gone away. That's part of Hawaii's history. So I suggest that the way out of this is through education. And the best thing we can do on education is incentivize it, encourage it. And you two guys are going to be leaders in that. So don't stop. Keep on doing it, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Uh, that was not a question, but thank you anyway. And by the way, what they did was they, they organized into the ILWU and they turned the tables on the plantation workers. So I'm going to let our two friends uh, go. And thank you so much for your participation. I just want to say thank you to the group and uh, just allowing us to be this in this space, Governor and Chad and Paul and Jay. Well, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, the key to the revolution in the 50s was the unions. OK, and the unions have to be mm, equal, equal minded. The unions have to help all of the groups, all of the communities within the unions. That certainly inclo includes the um, the hotel workers. It includes the restaurant workers. And the unions can be a big factor. What's going on now? Like this com Filipino community, Joe Coy said, if you, if, you have, if you ever admitted to a hospital, you know you saw Filipinos work. Well, it's true. The healthcare industry, and thank God uh, for it, mm. because those are essential jobs, and it's a growing industry and, and a great opportunity. Uh, but too many immigrants, particularly Micronesians, are working in the service industry jobs, and I don't necessarily mean hotels, as she said, McDonald's, uh, food service, and anyway, you should have more guests like that on this yeah. show. It, it just, uh, instead of hearing us all the time, although I love hearing us all the time, I we, think 
I think the main point I got was we, yeah. and I mean Hawaii, we need to listen more and to hear people that don't have a platform. And so Jay and Gov, my so, but, but but guys, I mean, uh, you know, let's let's let yeah, let's. Where do you think all of these people who are not being listened to are going to end up in the current American political spectrum? I think they're already there, but they're not as as Shanti said. They're they're not in these positions. They're not mentors. They're not in that boardroom. I mean, think about it. We've got two white people and two Japanese people in Congress. We have a white governor. We have a white mayor of Honolulu, uh, and 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 it is the whites and the Japanese that have dominated, frankly, the business, the politics, a few other groups, and, and that's going to take a while for that to happen. But it will happen, and I agree with Jay that these are leaders. You know, if it weren't for JoJo Peter. And Josie Howard talking to Maisie Hirono, herself an immigrant, you wouldn't have seen the changes to the Compact of Free Association. And it was Hawaii's delegation that led trying to convince the rest of the Congress to go along with them. And, and so uh, by listening to those young Micronesian leaders, Jojo passed away a few years ago, real change happened, uh, at least at the federal level. But there's much more to do, as Shanti said. Yeah, those, uh, I mean, what we know from studies of immigrant communities being socialized into U.S. politics is often the first generation, it, it, they don't really see politics as something for them. They, it's not something that they're following that closely. Um, you know, the, the difference between Republicans and Democrats is, is kind of lost. I mean, these people coming from other political traditions. Um, who are often still following politics in, in their home countries. But it takes leaders like that. I mean, it takes leaders like that to socialize them, to tell them this, this is for you. Um, politics and activism is something that um, you should be a part of, and we're going to train you how to do it. We're going to demystify it. Um, and I think that, you know, that the, I, I think we're beginning to see that in the Micronesian community. I mean, with, with leaders like the extraordinary guest we just had, um, I think over the next generation or so, we're going to see a lot, um, a lot more of that. But I also think that there are probably more opportunities. I mean, um, you know, I think that that Sergio's point about language access. This is something I hear all the time, and and you know, it's not something. I mean, it's one of the reasons we need to hear more voices because I don't think it's something that um, people who are fluent English speakers really think of as as much of a problem as it ends up being for. Um, for new immigrants who who um, who who need that, I mean, people like Amy Agbayani at UH have just worked tirelessly over the years to improve uh, improve language access. I mean, these are relatively small policy changes uh, that can be made that I think would make some of these spaces, even going to the DMV, um, a little less intimidating. If I may just add quickly, it wasn't just Filipinos that were in Lahaina. There were Micronesians in, in Maui. And when FEMA was there and Red Cross was there after the fires, one of the stories that didn't get out enough is there weren't enough people that were able to speak Chukis or Marshallese, the two dominant groups here. And then, of course, with Filipinos, you have Tagalog, Visayan, Ilicano, and, and also just with Micronesians in particular, because they're on this status with the I-94, a hesitancy to come forward and say, I'm sorry, but I... I, I don't understand. I need someone to translate, even trying to say that in English. Uh, and that was a big story that I think finally the government people started to recognize and getting people in place. It's DME, DMV is one thing. It's another thing when you've lost your home and you're looking for shelter and for food. You know, if you have a role model from your community and that person is an elected official, an important person that everyone knows, all sides of the equation know about that person, then you have um, something to ideate toward. And uh, your point, John, about, um, about the fact that Sergio ran against Ed Case two years ago, that is really profound. And I was wondering why he didn't run again, but I think you you, you had an answer for that. He was going to spend his time with the, the community for a while. But he should go back because he's the perfect choice. Well, because got, if he yeah, gets elected, yeah. he's a role model. We the, the One of the interesting things about the Filipino community is the number of successful role models that they are out there. I mean, there might have been no nobody yet to Congress, but you got a Supreme Court. You had two Supreme Court justices. Yes. Uh, you, in some respects, you, you, you know, you have uh, I don't know how many. You go into uh, Civil Beats uh, little, 
you know, platform and you're going to see a whole bunch of people with Filipino or at least part Filipino background. But what, what was interesting about Sergio's is the new Filipinos, the people who are coming in now, uh, because actually, and the, the Filipino community itself is in a very interesting situation. I mean, look at Jollibee spreading all over America. <laughs> There's 1.6 million Filipinos living between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, I, I, I mean, there is, I, would, I don't know what the situation may be, but I do know. And there is also, we didn't get to this, but there might be a potential clash uh, between people who come into uh, Hawaii to take jobs and whose interest is that because of, where they, of their circumstances and the new role Hawaiians who are, uh, 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 and I'm using that word particularly because it's not only native Hawaiians, it's a generation of Hawaii people who are starting to find uh, roots in defining Aina and so forth and so on. And, and not necessarily thinking that the future is more jobs. So it's it's uh, I, I think uh, this show was to show us that that um, the traditional coalitions of how to get elected with constituency may be evolving. I, I, I don't know. I mean, when I ran for governor, I mean, I, I, you know, I had the perfect uh, cultural constituency ticket. My wife was Okinawan and, you know, in the heart of the Japanese community. I'm native Hawaiian and my lieutenant governor was Filipino. If you can't get elected with that scenario in Hawaii, <laughs> what good is this? You're not very good at your job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I don't know if those things are that simple anymore. That's my, uh, you know, that's what my takeaway from all of this. Is. And but, you know, the myth starts to lose its polish when you have Micronesian, the way we treat the Kofa people. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah, the I mean, I agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Even to, to label them the Kofa people. I mean, they, they are human beings. They're coming here for opportunity. They're contributing to society. And yet and they they're have, island people. They are. They, are, they, they are. appreciate what it is that we, we, we pontificate about. We need more people to recognize that. We didn't talk about it very much, but uh, we live now in a country where racism is becoming normalized. Um, and I wondered if these guys feel it. Uh, I wonder if Hawaii feels it because they are not only immigrants or migrants, they're minorities. And query, how, how does the uh, craziness on the mainland affect them? How is it working on the mainland for them? Yeah, I, I, like, uh, you know, there's a huge population of people from Marshalls and Micronesia in Arkansas. Yeah. I, I mean, one of the fallouts of the Trump policies regarding immigration was to slow down workers that would work in the uh, Tyson Mills, right? On the other hand, what it did open up was the idea that with free immigration and not illegal immigration, it made possible for a, a lot of people who were stopping off in uh, Hawaii and California to continue going east and end up working in all these jobs in Arkansas. That's right. They're in the poultry. Huge They're population. Running. Yeah, they are. They are forming the. They are the poultry industry's workers. And in a place like Springfield, Arkansas, their population. They're already something like twenty five percent of the school population, and and they are American by virtue of their birth. And see, uh, and I wonder, you know, so th this whole thing is getting somewhat Spring, complicated. Springdale. I got Springdale. 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 Those Springdale. Are Springdale is where the... Uh, Springdale's been in the news a yeah, lot. It's a yeah, whole, not Springfield, Ohio. That's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's, <laughs> a next, that's another show, you know. Yes, it is. Anyway, uh, guys, we're right at the end of everything. And so I'm going to give everybody, like, the last shot. 
Uh, so, uh, Colin, you first, then Chad, and uh, you, the technician gets to pick up the rest of it. So, <laughs> so you know exactly how much time we have left. Go ahead, go ahead, Colin. Sure. I mean, I, I really feel like this was a show where I learned a lot more than I contributed, and, and happy to. Uh, uh, happy to hear about all the great work that that Shanti and, and Sergio are, are doing and to learn that there's, I mean, as we know, there's still a tremendous, um, a tremendous amount um, to do. But I think that um, it is it is important now to, to to support these efforts and the leaders of these communities, especially for younger people who are born in the United States. Um, you know, this is the moment when they're going to be assimilated into to politics and think of it as something that they should be participating in and run. Um, and um, I just think that needs a lot more attention, um, a lot more attention from the DOE and from the general political class to make sure we're bringing along everyone. Chad? I will just add quickly, um, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be difficult. It's not going to be, we may not be as, our problems may not be as pronounced as on the mainland, but the the current, uh, the depth, the fear, the hatred does exist here. And um, I do hope the Aloha can help inform our decisions, but we also need to be frank and recognize that we've really neglected some people and they're hurting. Dave? Well, you know, you were right, John. It's complicated. And we all said that. It's complicated. And one of the interesting things that make it complicated is that Hawaii, more than any other place in the world, is an immigrant community. Yeah. But the rule about immigrants applies here, too. I think that's what we've we've been discovering here. In other words, if you were in immigrant class number one, um, you, you're a little bit biased about immigrant class number two and two to three and three to four. And what happened on the plantations was the same kind of process. Um, so I feel we have a, a community burden, a larger community burden of trying to have the legislature, the government, the officials accurately reflect who's here. The modern approach, the dynamic approach for Hawaii is to recognize that our immigration process is not over. We have to give everybody a fair chance going forward. Well, we have heard from all the pundits, and if you want it, we want to hear from you. So if you get a chance, comment about this show where we will be putting it on uh, YouTube and a number of other places where you can read it. And meanwhile, we'll be back in a couple of weeks or so with another exciting episode of Think Tech Community Matters. And there is an upcoming election. Aloha, everybody.